History of the Khulafa Rashidin Session 12 The Decisive Battle of Yarmouk Having achieved a resounding victory at Ajnadain, Khalid ibn Walid, Amr ibn al-As and their men returned to Yarmouk where they joined up with the rest of the Muslim army. The mood was bright in the Muslim encampment and though joy was in order, the war was far from over. Under the leadership of Theodore, a huge Roman army arrived at al Waqisa, which was situated near Yermuk, and they made camp there and prepared for their upcoming battle with the Muslims. The Muslim army, whose leader was Khalid ibn Walid, consisted of somewhere between 40 and 45,000 soldiers, whereas the Roman army, which was led by Theodore, consisted of 240,000 soldiers. Therefore, the Romans outnumbered the Muslims approximately by a margin of 6 to 1. With the Muslim army encamped in Yarmouk, Roman forces gathered along the southern bank of the nearby river. Amr ibn al-As took the fact that the enemy was blocked by the river as a good sign. He said, O people, rejoice, for indeed Allah has blocked the Romans from crossing easily, placing in their way a river. Rarely does a blocked army from the back achieve anything good. As for Khalid ibn Walid, he employed a strategy that was never before used by the Arabs. His strategy involved the forming of divisions and subdivisions. In that spirit, he organized his army as follows. The central division of his army, which consisted of 18 subdivisions, in other words, 18,000 soldiers. This division was headed by Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah, who had with him Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl and Al-Qa'qa'a ibn Amr. The right wing of the army, which consisted of 10 subdivisions, meaning 10,000 soldiers, and it was headed by Amr ibn al-As, who was accompanied by Shurahbil ibn Hassan. The left wing also consisted of 10 subdivisions, and it was headed by Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan. The front division, and because of the nature of its mission, primarily involved guarding against the enemy in the case of a surprise attack, did not require a large force, and hence the front division instead made do with a relatively small number of fighters. And finally, the rear division, which consisted of five subdivisions, that is, 5,000 soldiers, which was headed by Sa'id ibn Zayd. Sa'id was in charge of certain administrative aspects of running the army. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud also had administrative duties. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud also had administrative duties, in addition to being in charge of handing out food rations to the soldiers and gathering the spoils of war from the battlefield. Al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad, who was known as a skilled reciter of the Qur'an, would walk between the ranks of Muslim soldiers, all the while reciting the chapter of Al-Anfal, as well as other verses that discussed the topic of fighting in the way of Allah. He did this to raise the level of morale among Muslim soldiers. The orator or speechmaker of the Muslim army was Sufyan ibn Harb. He would go from row to row of the army and encourage soldiers to fight bravely and sincerely for the sake of Allah. The overall leader of the army was of course Khalid ibn Walid. He was stationed in the middle of his army and he was surrounded by the most eminent of the Prophet's companions. Realizing that the upcoming battle was near at hand, the leaders of the Muslim army perceived the significance of the upcoming battle. It was, they knew a battle of epic proportions 
one that would decide the fate not just of Yarmouk or nearby cities, and not just of the region, but of a sham in its entirety. Khalid ibn Walid in particular knew that whichever way the battle went, it was going to be decisive in terms of its long-term consequences. If the Muslims were to succeed in defeating the Romans in the upcoming battle, the door to conquering the rest of Hashem would be swung wide open. After that, Muslims would perhaps face resistance, but not of the kind that could stop them from achieving all-out victory and expelling the Romans from Hashem. Victory, also, would lead directly to further conquests in Asia and Europe. Conversely, Khalid ibn Wali knew that if the Muslims were to lose the upcoming battle, the door to Asham would be closed, if not forever, then at least for a very long time to come. There were a great many eminent companions present at Yarmouk, and each one of them was called upon to provide words of encouragement to the lesser experienced soldiers in the army. In that spirit, Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah delivered this speech. He said, O slaves of Allah, help Allah, that is help his cause, and he will both help you and make your feet firm. Verily, the promise of Allah is true. O Muslims, be patient, for patience saves one from disbelief, leads to the good pleasure of Allah, and protects one from shame. Do not leave your rows. Do not take one step towards them that is your enemy and do not initiate fighting with them until I order you to do so, inshallah. Begin fighting with spears and protect yourselves with shields and adhere to silence, the only exception being the remembering of Allah you do within your own hearts and on your tongues. Mu'adh ibn Jabal said, be shy of your Lord by not having him see you flee from your enemy. When all the while you are in his grasp, when you have no one to seek refuge in except him, and when you have no honor without him. To his own soldiers, Amr ibn al-As said, O Muslims, lower your gazes, sit on your knees, and begin the fighting with your spears. Then, when they come to attack you, give them a respite from your blows until reach the edges of your spear's blades. At that moment, pounce on them the way a lion pounces on its prey. By the one who is pleased with truthfulness, gives rewards for it, despises lying, and rewards goodness with goodness, I indeed heard that the Muslims will conquer Asham, village after village and castle after castle from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So do not allow their size and their numbers to terrify you. For if you are true and sincere in the severity you show them in fighting, they will run away like baby birds. As the two armies faced one another, a Christian Arab perhaps not with the best of intentions, said to Khalid ibn Walid, How numerous are the Romans today, and how few the Muslims? True as his remark might have been, numbers, as Khalid reminded him, do not mean everything in war. He responded, Woe upon you! Are you trying to frighten me by mentioning the Romans and their size? In reality, the true measure of an army's size is not the number of its men, but rather the help it receives from Allah. If it is helped by Allah, then it is large, and if it is forsaken, then it is small. And when Mu'adh ibn Jabal heard the voices of priests and monks emanating from the enemy encampment, he said, O Allah, shake their feet, instill terror into their hearts. Send peace down upon us. Make us adhere to the word of piety. Make us love to meet our enemy on the battlefield. 
and make us pleased with your divine decree. The Romans came with ornaments and displays of elegance which they felt were befitting of their power. And they were accompanied by priests and monks who would recite the gospel to them and encourage them to fight bravely in the upcoming battle. Their arrogance and pride, notwithstanding, the Romans did come with numbers. From the vantage point of Muslims, the Romans looked like a huge black cloud in the horizon. And by chanting in loud voices, they seemed all the more numerous. The Roman army made camp in Al Waqisa, which was situated near Yarmouk. They were separated from the Muslims by a large valley, a valley that, considering the strategic positioning of both armies, acted as a huge ditch or wide trenches that the Romans would have a hard time traveling across. The Romans also organized their army into many divisions. They formed two lines of divisions. In the first line, divisions were formed into a number of circles. Each circle was formed by five divisions, and one circle was separated from the next by a sizable gap. Then, in the second line, the same circles of divisions were formed, except that they were stationed behind the gaps that were left between the circles of the first line. The Roman army was further organized in the following three groups, archers, horsemen, and infantrymen. The archers were in the front of the army, and it was their job to initiate fighting by launching into the air a number of arrows. Then, once they had completed their task, they were to retreat to the rear of the two wings of the army. The horsemen were stationed along the two wings of the army, and it was their job to protect the archers until they safely returned to the rear of the army. Whereas the infantry, their task was simple. It was to march forward, attack the enemy, and attempt to break through the enemy's rows of soldiers. The front of the Roman army was led by a general called Gerja, and the two wings were led by Mahan and Adaracus. As the two armies slowly approached one another, a team of Muslim delegates marched ahead of their army, which consisted of Abu Ubaid ibn al Jarrah, Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan, Dirar ibn al Azwar, and al Harith ibn Hisham. They approached in a manner indicating that they had not come to fight, and they called out to the leaders of Romans that faced them, saying, We want to meet with you. Permission was granted to them, and they were escorted to the inside of the Roman encampment. They were then taken to a commander named Tadarak, who was waiting for them inside of a tent that was made of silk. This was the brother of Heraclius. The Muslim delegates objected to entering the tent, saying, We do not think it is permissible for us to enter it. A carpet made of silk was then spread for them, but again, because of the material of the carpet, they objected, saying, We will not sit on this. Other arrangements were made, and then the Muslim delegates and Tadarak sat down to discuss terms of a truce. Since Tadarak refused both to enter into the fold of Islam and to pay the jizya, the negotiations ended quickly and the Muslim delegates returned to their encampment. According to an account that is related by Al-Walid ibn Muslim, the Romans also made an attempt to negotiate terms of a truce. Bahan asked Khalid ibn Walid to come and meet him in the middle of the space that separated the two armies. Bahan began their meeting by saying, Verily, we have long known that hunger and hardships have forced your people to leave your lands. 
So allow me to give each man among you ten dinars, clothing and food. I will give you these things if you then return to your lands. Then, next year, we will send you a similar amount of supplies. That Bahan meant to humiliate Khalid is an understatement. But Khalid was not to be outdone. He said to Bahan, We have not left our lands because of the things you have mentioned. No, instead, we are a people who drink blood. And it has reached us that no blood is tastier than the blood of Romans. And so that is why we have come. One of the top leaders of the Roman army, a man named Jarjah, walked ahead of the front row of his army towards the middle of the space that separated his army from that of the enemy. He then requested Khalid ibn Walid to meet with him. To all observers, both from the Muslim and Roman armies, it appeared as if Jarjah was making a final attempt at negotiating a peace agreement. But the two armies and the battle seemed less on Jarjah's mind than some questions regarding which he yearned for answers. When the two men met, they came so close to one another that the neck of each of their horses was touching the head of the other. Jarjah began their meeting by saying, O Khalid, I want information from you. But be truthful and do not lie to me. Remember that a free man does not lie. And do not deceive me, for an honorable man does not deceive someone who is asking questions about Allah. Did Allah send down to your Prophet a sword from the heavens? And did your Prophet then give that sword to you, informing you that you will not unsheath it upon any people without defeating them? Khalid ibn Walid replied, No, that is not true. Jarjah asked, Then why have you been named the sword of Allah? Khalid radiallahu anh, replied, Verily, Allah sent among us His Prophet, who invited us to embrace the truth. We turned away from Him. In fact, all of us distanced ourselves from Him. Then a change occurred. Some of us began to believe in and follow Him, while others among us disbelieved in and distanced themselves from Him. I was among those who disbelieved and distanced myself from him. Then Allah took us by our hearts and forelocks and guided us through his Prophet, may peace and blessings be upon him, and we pledged allegiance to him. He then said to me, You are a sword from the swords of Allah, a sword that Allah has unsheathed so that it can be used against the disbelievers. The Prophet then invoked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless me with victory. That is the reason why I have been named the Sword of Allah. I am the harshest of Muslims against the disbelievers. Jarjah then asked, O Khalid, what is it that you are inviting people to? Khalid said, we are inviting people to bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and that Muhammad is his slave and messenger. And we further invite people to accept and follow what the Prophet has come with from Allah, the possessor of might and majesty. Jarjah said, What about those who do not answer your invitation? Khalid ibn Walid said, Then we ask them to pay the jizya tax in return for which we protect and defend them against all foreign enemies as long as they remain loyal and follow the laws of the land. Jarjah asked, And what if someone refuses to pay the jizya tax as well? Khalid ibn Walid responded, We declare war upon them, and then we fight him. Jarjah then asked, And what is the status of someone who, today, 
answers your invitation and enters into the fold of Islam. Khalid ibn Walid said, Our status will be the same regarding all that Allah has legislated for us. We are all equal. The noble among us and the poor or low-born ones among us, the first among us and the last among us. Jirja said, Does one who joins you today receive the same reward that you all receive? Khalid ibn Walid said, Yes, in fact, more. Jirja asked, How can a person who joins you today be your equal when you have embraced Islam long before he did? Khalid ibn Walid responded, Verily, we are a people who have accepted this religion by force. Furthermore, we pledged to follow our Prophet at a time when he was alive, living in our midst. During that time, news from the heavens came down to him, and he would inform us about the book, and he would show us signs and miracles. And it is only befitting for people such as us, people who have seen what we have seen and heard, what we have heard, in terms of signs and miracles, to embrace Islam and pledge allegiance to the Prophet. As for you, you have not seen what we have seen, and you have not heard what we have heard, in terms of signs and miracles, and irrefutable proofs. So if someone among you truly embraces Islam with a good intention, then he is better than us. Jarjah then made a statement which he meant as a question. By Allah, you are telling me the truth, and you are not lying to me. Khalid said, By Allah, I have told you the truth, and Allah is a guarantor over what you have asked me and over the answers I have given you. At that very moment, Jarjah turned over his shield and went with Khalid to the Muslim encampment. As they were riding together, Jarjah said, Teach me about Islam. Khalid took him back to his tent and taught him about Islam, where he said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah and entered the fold of Islam. After this, the entire Roman army began an all-out assault against their Muslim foes. The left wing of their army attacked the right wing of the Muslim army and soon a gap opened up in the center of the right wing of the Muslim army. The gap both widened and deepened, resulting not just in serious losses for the Muslims, but also in a dangerous situation wherein Roman soldiers were able to reach the last rows of the Muslim army. At this dangerous juncture, Mu'adh ibn Jabal عن, called out to his fellow Muslims, O Muslim slaves of Allah, these people have been fierce in their onslaught against you, and by Allah, they will not be repelled or pushed back unless you are true when you meet them and patient when you trade blows with them. Then, descending from his horse, he said, Whoever wants to take my horse, then let him take it and fight upon it. He preferred to fight the harder fight, the fight that was fought on foot in the infantry division of the army. The Azd, the Madhaj, the Hadramut, and the Khulan, each of these tribes stood their ground, not allowing the enemy to get through their ranks. But soon, the Romans were too much for them, and the entire right wing of the Muslim army was pushed towards the heart of the army. As a result, a number of people in the Muslim encampment, which was situated in the rear of the army, became vulnerable and easy targets to the enemy. But the situation improved when a long wall of Muslim fighters stood their ground and, by engaging the enemy, kept enemy soldiers at bay, preventing them from attacking Muslims at the rear of the army. Some Muslim fighters did flee to the rear of the army, but they were met by Muslim women who began striking them with stones and pieces of wood. And all the while, 
the women were saying, Where is the honor of Islam? What about your mothers and wives? Are you fleeing and leaving us as easy prey for these disbelievers? Other women yelled out, You are not our husbands if you do not defend us. With these reminders, the soldiers who had retreated returned to their positions, knowing that it was better to stand firm and be killed by the enemy than to run away and be treated as a coward by fellow Muslim women. During this battle, Saeed ibn Zayd radiallahu one of the ten companions promised paradise, was martyred. One man who certainly did not flee was Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl radiallahu At the very suggestion of fleeing, he said, I stood firm and fought against the Messenger of Allah on many occasions. So shall I now, that I am following the truth, flee from you, O enemies? He then called out, Who will make a pledge with me to die today? His uncle, Al-Harith ibn Hisham, Dirar ibn Al-Azwar, and 400 of the bravest and noblest Muslims made a pledge of death with him. They then fought in front of Khalid's tent until they all became afflicted with serious wounds. A great many of them died, including Dirar ibn al-Azwar and Ikrim ibn Abi Jal himself. It was this vicious attack an onslaught of Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl and the 400 men with him that restored hope in the Muslim encampment. Al-Waqidi related a beautiful story about Ikrima and those who pledged along with him to die on the battlefield at Yarmouk. They continued to fight in spite of their wounds, but when more and more wounds were inflicted upon them, resulting in them all falling to the ground, they asked for water. When a drink of water was given to them, it was offered to one of them. He looked to the person beside him and said, Give it to him. When it was given to the other man, he looked to the person beside him and said, Rather, give it to him first. They continued in this fashion until all of them died without a single one of them having drunk even a sip of the water. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them all for their patience and sacrifice and love for each other. Khalid ibn Walid and a number of horsemen who were under his command attacked the left wing of the Roman army, which was busy attacking the right wing of the Muslim army. In this attack, the Roman soldiers were forced to move towards the heart of the Muslim army and 6,000 Roman soldiers were killed. At first, the Romans had the upper hand in the battle, but then they were repelled by Muslim soldiers and consequently lost all of the ground they had gained. Then, try as they might, they were not able to inflict any serious harm upon the Muslim army anymore. And this in spite of the fact that they outnumbered the Muslims by a ratio of about 6 to 1. By that point, the morale of the Romans was at an all-time low. That it sunk even lower when Khalid ibn Walid and his men killed 6,000 of their fellow soldiers was, to say the least, inevitable. How they asked themselves could an army so small be so resilient. Khalid ibn Walid, like any good general, understood the mindset of the enemy. With his successful strategy, he knew that he had broken their wills, and he could literally feel, see, and smell the fear in their hearts. The main part of the war, the part that had more to do with psychology than with weapons, was over with. With Allah's help, Roman soldiers were overcome by two feelings, fear and a sense 
of hopelessness. Fear and his sense of hopelessness. Confident now that, with the help of Allah, victory was within his grasp, Khalid ibn Walid called out to his soldiers, By the one who has my soul in his hand, their supply of patience has been depleted. And I indeed hope that Allah will grant you power over them so that you can kill them. Khalid ibn Walid then did something that signified his disdain for his own life, his desire for martyrdom, and his wonderful ability to seize opportunities. With a hundred horsemen by his side, he raced towards the heart of the opposing army, where 100,000 Roman soldiers were positioned. Whether it was terror that seized their hearts, or the inevitability of defeat, or the false impression, because of dust that was being kicked up into the air and because of the tenseness of the moment, that many more than 100 horsemen were coming towards them, Roman soldiers began to scatter in various directions. And this was before Khalid and his men even reached them. Encouraged by what they saw, the rest of the Muslim army raced behind Khalid. Then Muslim soldiers began to slaughter confused and fearful Roman soldiers. Meanwhile, the right wing of the Muslim army blocked every path from which the Romans could escape. And so, the Romans were trapped between the valley of Yarmouk, which was deep, and the Zarqa river. Next, the Muslims succeeded in separating Roman horsemen from Roman infantry. As a result, Roman horsemen tried to find a point of exit from which they could flee from the scene of the battle. Khalid ibn Walid ordered Amr ibn al-As to open up an escape route for Roman horsemen. After Amr executed Khalid's order, every Roman horseman rode away from the scene of the battle thus leaving the infantry to fight for themselves. No thanks to their fellow soldiers who had just fled from the battle, Roman infantry were left exposed and they had no way to escape with a large valley behind them and the river of Zarqa on the other end. What made matters worse was that they were linked to one another in chains a strategy they had employed in order to prevent soldiers from running away from battle. Trapped and with no protection from horsemen, Roman infantry were trapped along the edges of cliffs, for below them was the valley of Yarmouk. Then in the darkness of the night, the Muslim army attacked them, cornered against the edge of cliffs. Many Roman fighters fell down into the valley of Yarmouk, a fall so dangerous that it meant almost certain death. And because Roman soldiers were linked together with chains, when one of them fell, a whole group of them fell along with them, a strategy well thought out by Khalid ibn Walid. It was in this stage of the battle that the Muslims killed the most Roman soldiers. With tens of thousands of their fellow soldiers dead, the Roman soldiers that did manage to escape sought safety deep inside of Hashem, with some of them seeking refuge in the rest of Damascus. Victory was achieved. The Muslim soldiers delayed performing the Aisha prayer until victory was secured. Khalid ibn Walid spent that night in the tent of the leader of the Roman army, Tadarak the brother of the emperor of the Roman Empire, Heraclius. Until the morning, horsemen patrolled the area near Khalid's tent, killing all Roman soldiers they came across, and among the dead was Tadarak himself, who left behind as spoils for the victors many valuable possessions. In the morning, Muslims continued the process of collecting the spoils of war. The number of deaths at Yarmouk points to just how decisive of a victory the Muslims achieved that day. 3,000 Muslims were martyred at Yarmouk, 
and among them were some of the most eminent of the Prophet's companions, such as Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl, his son Amr, Salama ibn Hisham, Amr ibn Sa'id, and Sa'id ibn Zayd. Quite astoundingly, even though the Romans outnumbered the Muslims by a ratio of 6 to 1, the number of fatalities on their side was far greater than the amount of Muslim deaths. In fact, about 40 times greater. More precisely, approximately 120,000 Roman soldiers died at Yarmouk, either by falling down the cliff and ditch of Yarmouk or drowning in the river of Zarqa or on the battlefield. A statistic that put the Roman Emperor Heraclius into a virtual state of shock. Yermuk was one of the bloodiest battles that the Prophet's companions had ever taken part in. Yermuk has been described as being a battle during which one saw nothing except decapitated heads falling to the ground and severed hands flying in the air. The news of the defeat at Yermuk was too much to bear for Heraclius. When he was informed about the humiliating loss and the tens of thousands of Roman soldiers that had died, Heraclius first was put into a state of shock, and then was overcome by extreme grief and sadness. A short while later, bands of Roman soldiers made their way back to Antakya. Wanting a first-hand account of what had gone wrong, Heraclius said to them, Woe upon you! Inform me about the people who fought against you. Are they not human beings like you? They said, Yes. Heraclius then said, And did you not outnumber them? They replied, Yes, in every battle we were many times more than them. Then Heraclius asked, What then was your problem? Why did you suffer defeat at their hands? An older and wiser leader among them was the only one who ventured a reply. He said, We were defeated because they stand up at night to pray. They fast during the day. They fulfill their covenants. They enjoin good. They forbid evil. And they are just and fair among themselves. And because we drink alcohol, we fornicate. We perpetrate unlawful acts. We violate the terms of our covenants. We become angry and oppress others. We enjoin angry and senseless acts of violence. We forbid the things that please Allah. And we spread corruption throughout the earth. Even though the answer was bitter, but Heraclius replied, saying, Truly, you have spoken the truth. Heraclius appreciated the fact that while no one else had the courage to speak their minds, the old wise man answered him in a forthright, sincere, and fair manner.